And now it's time to introduce Professor Theo Zimopoulos to deliver his inaugural lecture, The Making of Design Creatives, Unlocking Design Capabilities to Address Societal Challenges. He is a Professor of Citizen-Led Design at the European University and is a professional architect. Anybody wants a house building? I know a chap. Um, he has led co-design and participatory action research projects working with citizens, communities and organisations across the third, private and public sectors. He has also conducted empirical studies of design cognition using brain imaging, fMRI, as well as computational and logical mathematical studies of design. He has worked on a variety of projects aiming to address a wide range of societal challenges. More recently, this includes projects that focus on sustainability of historic places of worship and developments of cross-sector design collaborations and the developments of places for healthy ageing, which is something I probably am quite close to, I feel, at times. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Theo Simon Popolis. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, thank you. And um, welcome, welcome everyone. And thank you very much for being here today in this lecture theater and online. Uh, in this lecture, I would like to essentially open a conversation about the work of citizens, professionals, and organizations that engage in a type of work that I call design creatives. I would like to discuss what unlocks their capabilities to address societal challenges. Uh, but who are the design creatives? Let me start with a quite personal account of the topic of this lecture. So this is me with my sister a few years ago. Uh, we grew up at the suburb of Athens in a place of, full of contradictions. People living in floorless houses, literally sleeping on the soil, on the floor, in an increasingly reduced agricultural area at the north of Athens. And next to them, Wealthy families living in villas with well-kept gardens and big trees often. And next to them again, empty land with full of, full of thrown away materials, usually construction materials, and wandering animals, dogs, sheep, and, and cats. And as a group of 20-year-old children, maybe 7 to 14 years old, we had our own conflicting societal challenges. After all, life can be hard when your shoes have holes, uh, when you risk to destroy them, destroy them in the rough terrain or in the mud, or when you don't know how to tie your shoelaces. And life can be hard for the whole place you live in, uh, when there are hungry animals looking for food, and then there are people playing poison bait really over, all over the place to fight dog biting. Such challenges were real issues, but also real opportunities to discover what mattered to us. It wasn't just about solving a problem. After all, we didn't know what was the problem. It was the design of the shoe, or the rough environment in the mud, the skills, or our teachers, the biting dogs, or the people who put poison baits. What was the problem? We were just eager to design a way out of something that we thought compromised our capabilities as individuals, but also as a place to be and act as we thought it was right, or to put it more academically, as we had the reason to believe it was of value. But we didn't know what was of value. So maybe take a few seconds to travel back to a place that you grew up and think of something that you think compromised your capabilities to be and act as you valued. And maybe we can discuss that at the end of the presentation. But in our case, as a group of 20, we designed the shoeless and the shoelacing ventures, as we call them, which included places to walk without shoes. A lot of that was on the trees. Prototyping new shoes, competition, an academy that provided training and paper certificates in shoelacing. We also had the animal welfare venture, which included properly constructed shelters with wood and carbon paper uh, for wooden and hungry animals. And unfortunately, I don't have pay, uh, pictures of those. Campaigns and, and champions for healthier dog life. <laughs> and we do that for the pure fun and, of course, out of boredom. But in the process, we're discovering what we had the reason to value. 
we created shoes, services, shelters, commodities, but we also we grew our communities. We grew friendships, we grew attitudes to each other, attitudes to nature, cultural practices. And I think the value of our work was not just the making of the shoe, the shelter, or the certificate, but it was the making of a place, the making of a network value that comes from an ecosystem of commodities, communities, cultures that unlock our capabilities to discover and achieve what really mattered to us. And that's essentially what I call today design creatives. Of course, since then, I realized that design creatives are not only children. It is a type of work that's carried out by citizens, professionals, communities, organizations that work across different sectors. Myself, I become, as Garth just mentioned, uh, I become professional architect, although I think my mind was still working as a design creative, thinking a little bit beyond the specification of a building. And later on, as a researcher, I start looking at the sources of design capabilities in the cultural and social spaces of people, but also in the mind of people, in the cognitive processes. So I start starting the, the neurological interaction in the brain that are essentially the sources of our abilities to address design tasks using brain imaging techniques, fMRI, and mathematical modeling. But then I met Sofia de Souza, the chief executive of the Glasgow's community-led design. This is a national charity that aims to connect people with design and design with people. And really I invite you to have a look at this organization as an example of a design creative. Sophia, together with Katerina Alexiou, Vera Hale, and myself and a growing network of academic individuals and organizations, we started a journey of probably more than 15 uh, funded projects by UK Research and Innovation Council to essentially discover these two questions. What are the sources of design capabilities that are rooted in the places that we live in, and how can we unlock them to address societal challenges? And that's the very topic of this presentation. So in the next slides, I would like to say very briefly a few words about what I think is the capability problem in societal challenges, the role of design, ways of unlocking capabilities to address societal challenges, and I conclude with the value of design creatives. So I approach societal challenges as challenges that are value-driven and rooted in places. Challenges that arise because there are deeply existential and value-formative situations. Not only value-driven situations, but also value-formative situations, like the one that we saw in my introduction from my childhood. Challenges that arise because there are very highly interconnected, complex issues, realities, and situations that are rooted, rooted in the place that we live. Situations that I think that create this porous boundary between the self and the other, the human, the non-human, the local and the global. And in these cases, places is not just a geography, it's not just a thing. It is a way of understanding reality as a place and a way of acting on reality as place. So in this context, societal challenges include a wide range of challenges from aging society, healthy aging, biodiversity, participation in shaping our built environment, participation in democracy, alienation from nature, all of these are examples of societal challenges. But there are different ways to conceptualize and act on these societal challenges. Societal challenges very often are seen as a problem of utility satisfaction, satisfying needs and desires in our society. And societal challenges are, again, very often seen as a problem of limited availability or resources, having limited access to critical resources to develop, to grow, to be satisfied. Societal challenges can also be seen as a problem of having limited opportunities to achieve something of value. And that's my particular interest. Limited, limited opportunities to access assets, but also limited power to make use of these assets to produce something of value for you or and for others. So take, for instance, the sustainability problem. The sustainability problem can be seen as a utility problem, where the focus is, is based on protecting intergenerational needs for the current and future generations, where needs are needs for food, shelter, and other utilities. But sustainability problem can also be seen as a resource problem, where the focus is on the idea of protecting or increasing in a valuable ecosystem of resources, of course, natural resources, but also social and cultural resources. And the sustainability problem can also be seen as a capability problem, as a problem where the focus is on the idea of protecting or enhancing the freedoms that we have, the opportunities that we have 
for the current and future generations to define what we have to, the reason to believe that is of value. And again, maybe, again, take just a few seconds to think of a societal challenge that really matters to you. But try to think of this challenge not as a problem of satisfied needs or as a problem of limited resources, but as a problem of limited opportunities that you have to access resources and limited power that you have to use the resources to make something important for you and for others. And again, that's a theme that maybe we can discuss later on. So my interest on capabilities, built on capability approach to human development that's originated actually by an Indian philosopher and economist Amartya Sen. And as you can uh, guess, the key question here is what is and can be the opportunity to just imagine what is of value, but also what's our opportunity to be able to do and be what is of value. And in this context, the core unit of interest, if you like, is this opportunity to access and convert assets, meaning valuable resources, connections that we have with others, skills that we have, knowledge that we have, materials that we have, into value situations. And, and this is a very basic example, but capability is then the opportunity, for instance, to access an asset, a bike, but also the ability to cycle and convert this asset into a, a, something of value, mobility. So overall, then, capability is this web of nexus of opportunities that we have to access and convert assets into something of value. But, and typically, it is perceived as a property of an individual, individual capability. The set of abilities to do or be something of value that is determined by our internal skills, knowledge, but also external condition, the social and political environment. But I would argue that capability can also define as a capability of places, as capability that arise because there is an added value or contested value in some cases, when human and non-human actors come together in certain time and space. So again, very basic example, the symbiosis of cats with humans, or dog and humans, is an example of a place capability. So overall then, very broadly, the capability problem in societal challenges can be seen, for instance, as a problem of equity of opportunities, a democratization problem, as a problem of creating opportunities, an innovation problem, or maybe as a problem of creating interconnected opportunities for human and non-human uh, actors, so ecological problem. Uh, but what's then the role of design in this context? Now, historically, design work has been a practice and professional service that is concerned with the research, development, and production of what I call in this presentation commodities to include products, built environment, services. But design work has also been an intentional and intentional catalyst in shaping society, in shaping cultures, in shaping ecosystems with a positive or negative effect on societal challenges. And design work is then a type of creative work, professionalized, but not always, that is situated within, but also across many different sectors, healthcare, leisure, hospitality, environment, engineering, construction, arts and design. And it's important to highlight that within these sectors, design work is carried out within design art industries, like uh, architecture or fashion or product design, but also in non-design industry, like healthcare, leisure or policy making. And I would argue then that there are three species of designers, well, we can, three colors of designers. The design commodity specialist, the architects, the product designers, the graphic designers, that work within a specific design industry with an expertise to respond to the need to satisfy a specific utility, housing, clothing, etc. And what they do is they deliver blueprints of a commodity that can be manufactured, can be constructed. Then you have the design entrepreneurs that work within and across sector with the expertise to respond to the need to identify a particular market. And what they do, they deliver value propositions of a commodity, as they call it, and, uh, and an entrepreneurial venture to make it real. And also we have the design creatives that work within and across sector with an expertise to respond to societal challenges and the need to protect or create something of value. And you can think of them that what they do is essentially they create projects, they create situations that make possible commodities and other assets, human, social and cultural assets, to be created, to grow our capabilities. So overall then, the design work can focus in these three areas. Commodity making, the making of building, production and services, that 
produce certain utility, so it is concerned with the utility problem in societal challenges. Design work that focus on venture making, the making of commodities and their entrepreneurial ventures that will mobilize, connect different human and non-human assets and resources to make this commodity real, so it's concerned with a resource problem. And we have design work that focus on change making, or I prefer to, to think of it as habitat making, making of commodities but also social, cultural and natural assets that grow our capabilities to achieve or protect something of value. And that is the capability problem. It's concerned with the capability problem. And this is the type of work which is the focus of design creatives. And broadly speaking, then design creatives work with communities or they might work with government to convert their experience and knowledge into practical ways to improve issues like social care. They might work with scientists to convert scientific knowledge into practical ways to improve people with visual impairment. They may work with artists and technologists, to, or they may work with local communities to improve issues of inequality and way of living in different places. And in all these examples, the design creatives are individuals. They are communities. They are professional organizations that work within this particular situation to discover and develop what is needed in terms of commodities. They don't know from the very beginning what is needed. What are the processes, practices, cultures, and communities to generate to pro and protect something of value? And these are the design creatives. And there are some key areas of work that characterize what design creatives do, the practice of design creatives. So design creatives will try to explore how things should be different explore pathways between the actual and potential. They explore actual realities to reveal their potential for the future, but also explore imagined realities to reveal limitations in the actual and, and create a pathway to a new actual. But also, they explore what creates difference, what creates value. So they explore the principles and the values that shape or should shape a reality but also they explore the specification and the properties of specific assets that could generate this value. So explore pathways between the principles of values of a situation, but also specification of properties. So overall design work can then be conceptualized as a movement at the intersection of these two dimensions. And you can, metaphorically thinking, uh, you can think of design uh, creatives that they work in these four rooms. At the top room, they work very hard to discover and conceive the principles and the values of actual and potential situations. But also, they may, then they go to the, top, the bottom rooms to work to discover and conceive the specific properties of actual and potential assets that could generate these value situations. And for the purpose of this presentation, I would like to uh, conceptualize the work of design creatives as four types of movement within this space as an immersive move, so design creatives will engage with the situation to discover what creates the value. They will have an inciting move. They will work to engage other people, other organizations, mobilize their assets to create something of value, but also an integrative move. They will start connecting assets to situations to unlock potential, or an inventive move, the other direction. They will devise new assets, a new situation, to critically reflect about the actual and shape the new action. So now let me go a little more in detail about the making of design creatives. I would like to share some insights about the sources of design capabilities of design creatives. And the intention here is to synthesize empirical observations that are drawn from several Ukraine funded projects that were co-designed with Glasses community-led design in collaboration with many other academics and uh, communities and cross-sector organizations. And overall, this includes work with over 75 places of uh, design creatives. In all these projects, the research team needs time work with and as a design creative to respond to a wide range of societal challenges, which was different in each project. But they are grouped here in four categories for simplicity. Challenges and opportunities that are stem from particular places, towns, buildings. Uh, challenges and opportunities that arise uh, in multiple places, like the sustainability of historic religious buildings or challenges and opportunities that arise because of the interaction or the need for the interaction between different places, so cross-place collaboration, and challenges and opportunities that arise because we live in a network society like poverty or uh, aging society, healthy aging. 
And in all this project, we work with and as design creatives to co-develop practical approaches, which I call them here sources, to unlock capabilities for design work, but also by doing that, to start co-developing knowledge on what foster or inhibits design abilities for work, for design work. So I would like to share four stories that follow these four categories of societal challenges. My first story is from Tidworth Mans, which is, uh, it was part of a much bigger program, project, which was called Unearthed Hidden Assets. And you can see the partners uh, at, the to at the bottom of this slide. Now, in this corner of the project, the context was the life of women that have their husband in the army and live in garrison town, far from the support of their families, and facing often uh, challenges that are similar to people living as single parents. And, and that was because they have limited opportunities to be together as family, as their husband was away for long periods of time, but also limited opportunities to build and maintain friendships or to build and develop personal uh, interests. Even driving license was very difficult due to frequent and in short notice relocation. And the design creatives in these cases was the research team, but also the group of women who develop this self-identity as a design creative team that has this objective to improve the well-being of people living in garrison towns and they have also the very active participation of a community area manager from the local council. And we engage with them in a type of work that I mentioned in my introduction as immersive work to unearth what is of value, what creates the value. And one of the things that we did is to create the asset mapping room. That was a room of mapping assets, mapping resources, skills, connections that they have with others, in order basically to frame what is of value in their situation, but also to form and plan specific initiatives, design initiatives that could generate value in their life. And the asset mapping room had physical prompts with suggested type of assets, spaces, people, infrastructures, media, that were represented by different material objects. And this material object was quite important. The, the materials encouraged the activity to identify all these diverse assets that they have that were actively used to define a particular value situation at the center of the map. So for instance, a lot of that was about play, or play as a, as a way to socialize with others. But also use this map to connect assets in order to frame new value situations at the center of the map that were not previously perceived, but also to generate specific ideas of design initiatives that can combine cluster-specific assets together to create a pathway to a value situation at the center. And this type of work, asset mapping work, has progressively created this dominant driving concept for that group, a place service for children that would enable parents to connect with each other and find mutual support in these garrison towns. And this concept emerged from connecting existing assets. They're already doing some play uh, activities with toddlers, they have access to a leisure center, and they had also a Facebook, Facebook group that reached almost 1,000 members that enabled the group to, to test, but also gather interest and support for concepts like uh, this one. And this type of immersive work developed the opportunity and ability within the group to develop a strategic view of their situation, develop what I call in this presentation strategic capabilities, but also to discover new driving concepts that can create a pathway to a value situation, which I call them here inquisitive capabilities. We also engage in the type of work that I mentioned, inventive work, to devise new assets, new situations, to, to critically reflect about what was happening actually in the situation and shape the new actual. So one of the things that we did is to create places that provided opportunities to build on and scale up existing lived activities, existing lived experiences that were value from the community. And as I mentioned in the previous slides, that was quite a lot about play activities with toddlers. To scale this up into a play service for children that enabled building social connection between parents. And we devised a soft play service. Uh, we use the local leisure center that they have access to to prototype and scale up different forms of play that we have experimented in different ways, as adventure, as movement, as creation with arts and craft, while parents have the opportunity to connect with each other and find mutual support. And 
And this type of inventive work created, again, the opportunity and ability for the group to build on and scale up on existing lift experiences that were valued from the local community. So lift capabilities, how I call them here, but also to imagine and test the value of new lift experiences, imagine capabilities. And indeed, this day service reached more than 150 families, almost 300 children, and had a gross income that made it a sustainable service. And the event has become actually a blueprint for a place service in local area, created opportunities for local parents to connect, but also very importantly, to develop skills and transferable models of practice for other garrison cities. My second case now stems from another project which is called Empowering Design Practices. And that was a project about the future and resilience of a uh, uh, historic place of worship and the sustainable future. The context of this project was the fantastic stock of historic religious buildings that we have in this country. And really, I want to say that twice, there's a fantastic stock of historic religious buildings that we have, but also the heritage experts. Uh, the increased interest on how place and community leadership in design can contribute to the sustainability in, uh, and the resilience of these places. But also, very importantly, the context was the custodians, that people, they increased pressures that uh, people that look after historic places of worship have to sustain these heritage treasures and very complex buildings, but also to serve the local community, to serve their faith community. And also, of course, the context was the place and the community more broadly. An increased interest from local citizens across different faith groups or non-faith groups about the value of place uh, of worship as social and cultural resource, and as, in particular as a source for addressing complex societal challenges like poverty or COVID, actually, more recently. So all these people faced immense tensions and pressures, in particular the custodians, in terms of what is possible, what aligns with my values, what is of value. Is it about creating a place which is comfortable for worshippers? Or it's about to open up to all different people from different faith groups? Or it's about creating a place that serves the God? Or it's about highlighting the history and the heritage of the place? These are complex tensions in this project. And the design creators in this case was, again, the research team with domain experts, but also the custodians, the people that look after historic places of worship with the participation of members from the faith community, but also local citizens. And we work with them in a type of work that I call inciting work, to engage other people, other organizations, professionals, mobilize their assets to create certain new value situations. And one of the things to do, we did is to create a lot of places for design engagement, as we call them. And that was places with social and cultural activities, more structured workshops, or more free games that incite people to start reflect and creating stories, pictures, artifacts about the actual situation in place of worship, but also the potential, what could happen in the future. And a lot of that was setting up simple provocations for, to trigger interactions between people, such as setting up places for people to co-create postcards uh, with messages for people that were not present, or more systematic approaches for capturing and making sense of the different assets that people bring, ideas or challenges, to identify opportunities for design initiatives. And blue cards that you see in the second part picture is this design initiative that we're imagining, but also to create, make and prototype ideas about the actual and potential, and more importantly, activity that engage worshippers, users, potential users, and experts to form what I call here design creatives. And this inciting work created the opportunity and ability within the group to trigger connections between people, connections between their ideas, connections between people with the heritage of the place, connections between the natural environment around places of worship. So it created some form of connective capabilities. As well. But also, very importantly, to convert these connections into specific ideas for design initiatives, and more importantly, into collaborations that make these design initiatives possible. So some sort of form of collaborative capabilities. And local design creatives across many different places that we work with said things like, these activities brought us together as a team. I have gained skills and confidence to help lead the design process and engage my community in it. And particularly this second comment was very common across many different places that we work with. We also engage in a type of work that I call immersive work, to understand what is of value. 
So we created places where, uh, that provide tools for collaborative creation of a strategic rationale for their place of worship. So people will map capabilities, will map assets, and have specific templates to connect them to create a strategic rationale. And in the case of churches, that was a lot about purpose statement. Places for discovering a shared vision, a shared purpose for working together. And people will share their priorities, they will share their concern and principles of success and their values, and use specific techniques to cluster them into individual, share, and conflicting. And on that basis, form smaller teams that co-author purpose statements and visual statements that incite them to work together. And this work created the opportunity and ability to, as we saw with Stidworth Moms, to develop a strategic view of a situation, strategic capabilities, but also to discover driving concepts that enthuse people to participate. So local design creatives said that this encouraged people to think laterally and explore things, how things may happen. It's a catalyst. It has altered our perception, our vision, the size of our vision. We engage in inventive work to invent new assets, but slightly different from the Tidworth Mums case. Here we're trying to create places for developing a shared language, a shared design language. And that's in terms of key concepts that you use, key terms that you use, or what is to be created. And concept develop activities that use materials to guide you to develop these concept designs using thematic areas like <laughs> delight, flexibility, legibility but also storytelling and story-making activities using imagery from different places and, and situations. Making activities where you create physical models of a and, and physical metaphors of ideas. And prototyping activities, such as, for instance, organizing competitions that invite local people and local organizations to prototype and test the viability and value of specific ideas for spaces, services that might happen within places of worship. And this type of uh, inventive work, as exactly has happened with Tidworth Moms, created the opportunity and ability to build up and scale up on existing lived experiences of communities, but also to imagine and test new lived experiences. And uh, design creators across cases, they said things like, this helped us to feel that we are on the right path, created a sense of possibility, be able to do things that you previously didn't think you can do. And this theme of making possible the impossible was quite common across the different places. Finally, a different type of work that we engage with them, it was kind of integrative work to integrate and connect, connect different actors and knowledge sources to create a new potential. So we created places that were heritage experts, building professionals, users, and potential users create new forms of design practices. Ways of working that enable design concept and more importantly, design leadership to emerge from the distributed and collective work of all these people. Essentially breaking the boundaries between the notion that there is a client that provides a problem and a building a heritage expert that provides the solution. But also ways of working that keep incubating a diversity of different ways of working and diversity, a diversity of initiatives that contribute in these places and these projects. And it created this opportunity and ability within the group to integrate diverse sources of our knowledge into this collective ecosystem with a network value, but also to incubate diversity of initiatives and, uh, that contribute to these collectives. So some sort of coordinating and incubating capabilities. And I do like these quotes quite a lot. Uh, one of them said, I think now we can work with them, meaning architects and heritage experts, as opposed to one-way traffic. There are two different projects, one, another one said, about building design and social mission, aren't they? They are not. They're totally, totally integrated. And the research team, as a design creative, supported over 50 places to develop their own design initiatives, over 400 people to develop skills and confidence to work as design creatives, and over 1,000 members to directly engage uh, in um, uh, members of the public to directly engage in design initiatives. And also local partners, as design creators themselves, themselves, influenced change on morale and attitudes about place, connected communities, responded to societal challenges that were really relevant to the places, but also secure funding for activities and services to respond to these challenges. 
Now, my third case stems from two projects, uh, the Scalenap project, uh, and I'm very happy that Anne Light is today with us <laughs> in the lecture theater. Scalenap project, uh, and, the, and a more recent one, uh, which is very shortly called uh, uh, cross-pollination. And both projects were aimed to unlock capabilities to carry out design initiatives through cross-sector and cross-disciplinary uh, collaborations. And, and the context was exactly that, that the multidimensional nature of societal change requires this cross-sector and cross-disciplinary collaboration. It requires them, it's not a, just a wish list. And design creators in these cases were the research team uh, with professionals across different sectors, academics and local communities. Um, and across the years, we created many places that essentially support the development of design initiatives in local places, uh, but also, more importantly, design creatives, the formation of design creatives by engaging in all these different forms of work. And since inception, the, uh, in 2013, cross-pollination has been adopted in many different projects, more than 10 projects and situations uh, that you can find in this booklet. And generally speaking, as an, as an approach, cross-pollination is organized in four work to respond to the working areas that I mentioned throughout this presentation. So people uh, will share and map existing areas of work, existing projects, challenges that they have, uh, capabilities that they have in terms of skills and resources, but also they will use specific cards to trigger connections between these uh, different projects, the challenges and the complementary skills that they might have. They will use the identified connections to frame new initiatives and new collaborations and also the new, they will use the new collaborations to bring more assets to scale out and scale up this initiative. And the value of design creative work in this project was that it led to a growth of a network of design creatives and design initiatives. But for me, more importantly, the importance was that it increased the centrality, meaning the visibility, the impact, the access to support of previously marginalized groups, individuals, their issues and their design initiatives. And I think that was the most important value of cross-pollination approach. And my fourth case then stems from another project which is uh, quite recent, so I'm going to be very brief. And it is about, uh, it's called Wise Connection, and it's about aging society and the importance to age creatively for the well-being of individuals, but also our society at large. And the context is obviously that we are all growing, uh, as Garth noticed at the very beginning. Uh, but evidence also shows that as we grow older, there are fewer and fewer opportunities to reimagine and develop and integrate into our life things that we really value to do or be. And this is a multidimensional issue related with social isolation, poverty, sometimes it's cultural attitudes, but also psychological factors. And the design creatives in these cases is the research team, with, uh, which in this is take the form of a social venture that aims to create opportunities to age creatively within the homes of people, but also in public and, and professional spaces, with the participation of uh, professionals and citizen champions, citizen champions. And the core idea here is to think outside of the box for our life. And a little bit of irony here is that we use a box to achieve that. A box that is distributed uh, at homes as a past the parcel box, uh, GP practices, libraries, coffee shops, uh, that encourage to self-discovery, development, and realization of such initiatives. So the box will invite you to uh, explore hopes of other people, what they value to do or be, invite you to provide a gift in terms of ideas, skills, resources that you have that can turn a hope into reality, invite you to, be, to incite others by writing a letter of a hope, but also to take an integrative action to connect assets to make, uh, to realize a de design initiative. And at the moment, boxes are distributed in London and uh, Bristol as static boxes uh, and as moving boxes, as past the parcel box, door to door. And maybe one day you will receive one of those boxes. Uh, and in conclusion then, uh, I would like to share some overarching observations about the value of design creatives and the source of design capabilities of design creatives. So clearly, the work of design creatives arises at the intersection of these four working areas that I mentioned in this presentation, immersive, inciting, integrative, and inventive. And, but very importantly, the work of design creatives' work stemmed from and created these four pairs of capability sources. 
inquisitive and strategic capabilities, emerging and lived capabilities, connective and collaborative, coordinating and incubating and consistent capabilities. And across the cases, the value of design creative work was the relevance that they created, the relevance of their design innovation, the form places, the form habitats, ecosystems with network value, but also the form the citizens that had the opportunity to discover and shape what they had the reason to value. Like, as you saw in my introduction from my childhood. But across the cases, also the value of design creatives was empowerment. They made visible issues, values, people that were previously hidden, marginalized, as we saw with the cross-pollination place. Empowering these people and groups to achieve something of value for them and others. And that was empowerment through design, but also it was empowerment to design. They created infrastructures, skills, and attitudes that develop viable, to develop viable and, uh, and valuable design initiatives. In some cases, indeed, design creatives play a key role in leveraging almost six million to tackle issues of social isolation. And the value of design creatives is the resilience in societal challenges that made possible to address what was previously perceived as impossible, multidimensional, and value-sensitive challenge. And the value of design creatives, finally, is the joy. The joy to be part of a design creative. And on that note, I would like to thank all the people that participate in this uh, project, which is unfortunately impossible to name or list. I have here some pictures from the uh, research team, and unfortunately I don't have all the pictures of the research uh, teams. And on that note, I would like also to highlight uh, the role of the mighty and legendary design group at the Open University. Uh, and I particularly I would like to highlight the role of uh, Emma Dewberry and Derek Jones, um, because over the last two years we developed this new design qualification and that shaped a lot, the concepts that I presented in this presentation, so it's particularly relevant for this presentation. And also I would like to thank the one and only, I and say that very strongly, the one and only Professor Jeff Johnson, who plays a harmonica here, and who is the most empowering person that I know. Uh, our design creative, of course, Sophia de Sousa, and the Glasgow's community-led design as a whole, as an organization, for all the generous contribution to the EU in terms of research and teaching. Uh, the most complete academic that I know, and, okay, you are the guiding light on many uh, complex weather conditions. Um, but also the next generation of design creatives that provide all the graphics that you saw in this presentation. And I don't know what they're doing there now, but it must be quite important. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So now it's time to hear from the audience and to hear from you in the lecture theatre. And if you're online with any questions and comments about the talk that's raised for you, please send them through. Uh, Theo, would you like to join me in the seating area? Absolutely. So I, I'm, I'm sure, uh, like me, you've got many, many questions, but if you wish to raise a question, please raise your hand. Please wait until a roving mic gets to you uh, and reach to you, and then please, if it would be great if you could introduce yourself and where you are from. Uh, please also keep the questions uh, short so we can get as many questions uh, in as possible. Uh, we also invite comments from our online audience uh, using the email provided or the slide that's currently showing, I think. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Okay, well, I, I, I've got lots of questions here. If, I'll use chairs. Oh, Emma. I have to ask a question, don't I? <laughs> um, Emma Dubry from Open University. Um, thanks, Theo, for that really thoughtful um, and inspiring lecture. I think. Um, and maybe it goes back to the picture of you in a tree as a kid, but I'm thinking that a lot of what you've talked about today is about systems, about interconnectedness, about being able to see these really unique relationships um, between people, communities, and their environments in which they sit. And it also makes me think 
quite sadly, actually, that our education system doesn't seem to value that particularly. We see still very much, you know, drive our education in terms of um, individual disciplines, perhaps not seeing connections as we should. And it poses a, a question for me, which is, you know, given the value of what you've presented today and the value of um, being more interconnected and, and systemic in our thinking, what future do you imagine um, ideas like design creatives have when, you know, our education system is perhaps a little behind the curve on, on celebrating and supporting more interconnected thinking? Of a very important uh, question, Emma. Thank you so much. Um, and a very difficult, challenging question. Um, I think this is the challenge of the future and uh, in terms of how we develop education that take into account this more and more increased area of uh, work um, that in our pre my presentation I call it as the work of design creatives, that they take this systemic view as you uh, describe it. Um, they often, uh, in practical sense, they don't even know what needs to be developed in terms of commodities, whether they develop uh, a building, whether they develop uh, a technology. And so they are facing, the, it's an extremely complex situation to be in. Um, and, um, and, and education needs to be, uh, we need to reimagine how education happens in this context because you have a situation where someone needs to be able to address complex uh, situations with, uh, with an expertise which is, um, you can't really have expertise just on materials or on buildings uh, or on humans or it, it is a systemic thing that you need to, the, 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 the networks, the connectingness uh, and we, that requires special skills and special uh, abilities and um, and and that's the thing that uh, I, I have to say Anne Light is on the audience so I don't put it in the spot at all but she was very influential in, in my thinking on that I was trying to explain uh, what uh, um, her influence to me and her influence to me it was exactly of Theo, stay for a moment and think about the whole situation that you're facing in and trying to work with people to discover what are these uh, complex situations. Uh, as design, with my design background, you usually end up going straight away to respond to issues and challenge with a solution. But that's the message. No, you stay behind trying to ena create the enable conditions for things to happen and the water will lift you up um, and this that the water will lift you up is the thing that uh, Professor Onlight uh, really uh, taught me um, through practice he doesn't even know uh, but through practice okay thank you the gentleman on the left um, that was incredibly inspiring um, and very uplifting, uh, so thank you. Uh, I, uh, I work at the Community Foundation here in Milton Keynes, I'm at the OU, and w um, we have a, um, really big plans of developing uh, new community hubs in the city. Um, and it is really hard, extremely complicated and very frustrating, so I'm after a few tips and ideas about how I deal with the politicians, uh, the naysayers, uh, the money people, the economics, the value engineering um, people, um, so that the, the aspiration, the trueness of what we want to do to build hubs that really reflect and grow with our communities can be delivered. Again, uh, this is, these are, I'm very happy that I have these questions because this is really at the core of um, my interest and my motivation and uh, um, they're, they're not simple answers, of course, uh, but uh, the, there are certain indications in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, the, there are things, I, I think my, my lesson is a lot of things need to happen organically. 
and I really put a value to these initial seeds, the small seeds, the small groups that will grow a, a certain initiative and uh, scale it up and scale it out, not necessarily up. Um, and, uh, and, and that is quite maybe fundamental principle because sometimes we, and we, we tend, and I used to tend to do that quite a lot, of, okay, let's create community places and to bring the whole community here. That was not exactly the point. It's about creating these small things that have the potential to grow. Even the box that I mentioned for uh, creative, it's an example of that. It's just a box that goes through door to door. But that also now generates a specific community group that works in uh, in certain place. So th that small initiatives that can trigger connections, can trigger uh, um, uh, collaborations, and, and most of the terms that I use in, in this presentation is my you know bottom line uh, approach, um, which I think it was the most successful for me. Uh, in terms of politicians that you mentioned, because they are important part, as actually, of that spectrum. Uh, and, and the scaling up and scaling up uh, project and, and the cross-pollination was quite a lot on what is the meaning of that? Is it scaling up or is scaling out? How uh, and, and is it about organic growth that goes like a tree or it's about the tree and you, you grow something big, uh, an infrastructure which is big? Uh, and and again, I think I would engage poli uh, policy makers and policy advisors uh, in, in a local small project and grow rather than big interventions in spaces and in places um, as a general principle. Um, but I, I will never stop talking about that. I need to, uh, but I think, yeah, I think that summarizes a little bit of my thinking. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We have a. A question online, and it will come to yourself, sir. Yeah, there are some lovely comments on the YouTube live channel, actually. One from Maya Luna. Wow, what an amazing distillation of many years of work. Absolutely inspiring. And Sophia D'Souza. I said, how wonderful to see 10 years of inspiring collaboration explained so clearly and evocatively. It made me feel quite emotional about, about it and hugely proud of what we have done together in this this space, but she goes on to say that she's sorry not to be here, but her question is, what shall we do next? <laughs> From Sophia? Oh. <laughs> well, of course, well, Gareth. Okay, let's discuss about that. <laughs> uh, yes, it, I think that, that, that's a question uh, that we're discussing uh, quite a lot with Sophia, because there was the, the, there was a growth and there was a lot of projects and there was a lot of uh, collaborations with uh, various organizations, network of organizations. And there was how, how we can really create uh, places where optimize this kind of connections that you have and collaborations that you have and, and the energy uh, and the passion. Uh, and, um, and we are thinking about ideas like creating hubs within the EU, the EU to become a hub, which is already, to some extent, is by nature, but to make it more, to find infrastructures and processes to make that happen. Not to promote our specific research, but also to allow uh, more researchers to develop and grow. Uh, and that includes also other... Sorry, I'm talking to Gareth, uh, uh, because I actually I wanted to have this conversation uh, with him and uh, we discuss about these things and that's my opportunity as well, so then we make it publicly. Um, uh, but I, I think Sophia's question is valid not only for our corner, for many people that are working and, and, and develop this sort of collaborations and strong connections with uh, other organizations, non-academic organizations and academic organizations. How do we, in, as a society and as universities, what do we do to foster them and to make use of them? Uh, because with time, this you know, is going to be lost. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, I'm not saying only for the open university, that's for all universities that, uh, and all academics that there are, and organizations that engage with all universities. Brilliant. So we have a question there still? Yeah. Hi, I'm Michael Ngosom here, Business School. I thank you very much, Theo, for the inspiring uh, presentation. Um, I was interested in your three types of uh, 
design, the architect, the entrepreneur, and the design creatives, a bit more the entrepreneurs, for those of us who teach in uh, entrepreneurship or do research in entrepreneurship. What, what do you see? I mean, you identify as I, three ideal types, right? Um, so I'm interested in whether an entrepreneur can become a design creative and uh, what you see as some of the constraints or the enabling conditions for how we can uh, prepare entrepreneurs for that? It, it, it feels like the questions are planned. Uh, they're not, because this is a, a really, a, a, and I had another presentation that the slide had the three colors and actually mixed up, because actually this distinction, there is a little bit of artificiality on, on this distinction. And um, the, the, and the design entrepreneurs are extremely close to um, design creatives. I participate currently in a project by, uh, it's a Ucrit funded by, uh, they have the partnership of Zinc, an organization which is really another very beautiful organization that invites you to have a look. But they have the, uh, the goal to support you not only to develop research but entrepreneurial research essentially. And, uh, and I, I work with, uh, in, in a cohort with uh, maybe 25 people, I think, uh, 28. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on the number, but that, that sort of uh, size. And, um, and, the dis and these are people that develop projects of the sort that I mentioned, essentially, but a lot of that is about healthy aging. Uh, and you can see the distinction between design creative and design uh, entrepreneur is not very clear because they work to address big societal challenges, to protect or create something of value, and 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 the and the sense of their expertise, the expertise that we develop is that the expertise develop projects that make possible to discover what commodity is created here, what what is needed here, which the design entrepreneur as well a lot of times doesn't know what commodity needs to be created in order to uh, make something uh, of value. Maybe the difference is a little bit that the focus is more on, on market, identification of market and market opportunities, the entrepreneurial venture, how you structure this entrepreneurial venture, where the design creative in my qualification is, uh, uh, it is a concern, as you saw with Tidor Moms, they did an entrepreneurial venture at the end, but it is one possible uh, kind of outcome. Uh, so they are very overlapping, so the question is very good because, oh, yes, I, th I thought... Th okay, we, we have time for one more question. A visa, yeah. The one and only, as he was in the slides. Well, the one and only. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, uh, um, uh, a great lecture, of course, um, with many dimensions, but uh, I picked up on something which I thought found particularly interesting, which was you said, uh, design is value-driven, which of course it is. Um, but you also said that design is value-formative. Formative. Um, that's very interesting. So I, it made me think that there's a, a co-evolution between design and the values that underline design. Um, would you like to say more on that? <laughs> spot, spot on again. And uh, yes, that actually, that's the most important implicit message, I think, in my presentation. Uh, because typically design, historically, when we talk about design, we, we, we frame it as part of a problem-solving, problem-framing kind of narrative. And the notion of a value is really aside, you don't see it clearly. And I realized through this project that the notion of forming value systems it is so important uh, in these situations and which actually underline all your understanding of the problem and all your understanding of where the solution lies. So, th and, and so this for value formative uh, um, uh, situation that characterizes design is very, very imp important. And that's my main message, basically. That is, we, we need to look at it more from that perspective. Okay, so firstly, I just want to say a massive thank you, Theo, for absolutely inspiring lectures, as the gentleman here said. But, but for me, you know, a, a good acid test is if it challenges your thinking, if it challenges your understanding, and it, it, it certainly did that, and it was very, you know, um, well, words fail me at this moment, it was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Uh, all uh, that remains for me to say is to thank you for joining us today and for always supporting the Open University. In the meantime, have a very good afternoon and thank you.